True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Jeff Wright was always looking for a good time. When he met his future wife, Susan, he thought she would be a good time. But then things between the two became something more than just fun. Susan became pregnant, they married, and they moved into a house in the suburbs of Houston. But it was not happily ever after, not even close. Join us at the quiet end for The Last Seduction. After stabbing her husband to death in 2003, Susan Wright claimed that she had acted in self-defense after years of abuse. But prosecutors argued that Susan had never reported any abuse to the police and that she had plotted and carried out Jeff's murder in cold blood. At Susan's trial, prosecutor Kelly Siegler described Susan as a calculating wife who seduced her husband into bed, tied him up, stabbed him 193 times, and then buried his mutilated body in their backyard, all in order to collect on his life insurance. Susan's only chance at convincing the jury of her innocence was for her to testify in her own defense. But was her testimony enough to overcome the brutal details of what she had done? The beer for this episode is Atrial Rubicite, brewed by Jester King Brewery in Austin, Texas. This is a wild ale. It is a wonderful, wonderful beer. That's ruby red color. Not much of a head to it. Got a nice aroma of raspberry and that, that funky kind of sour barnyardy aroma. Very nice. Tastes like raspberry jam, tart berries, and a little oak. Very nice tart wild ale. Yes, I've been looking forward to this one all week. It looks delicious. And it is. You know, last time we did a Texas case, I did Lone Star Beer for my beer review. Yeah, that was very disappointing and for all of us. And we got excoriated. It was bad. I <laughs> well, it's, I was just looking at one of these iconic Texas beers. I know, but it's not good. We expect a good craft beer from you. <laughs> so well, I'm glad that you changed tax and we have such a beautiful beer today. Yeah, but we have a bonus coming up, bonus episode. It's also Texas, and I'm threatening to do a review of Pearl. Yeah, I've never heard of Pearl, though. Is that pretty basic? It's a very basic Texas beer. Good beer. All right, well, let's open that up because I am really looking forward. You got it. All right, Dickie, come on down here to the quiet end and I'll let you get us started. Okay. So Susan Lucille Weich had a sheltered small town upbringing about 30 miles outside of Houston in the town of Tomball. As a child, she was a Girl Scout brownie and a member of the church youth group. Then in high school, she'd been a bit of a homebody, usually staying home to hang out and watch movies with her mom. But as soon as she was old enough to be on her own, she couldn't wait to move to Houston. She answered an ad for pretty young blondes to dance at Houston strip clubs. So every Saturday for a couple months, 18-year-old Susan went on stage at a strip club bar wearing nothing but a G-string. She's really escaping the shackles of her home life, isn't she? She really was, and I certainly wouldn't judge anyone for doing that, but I'd have to say it's brave. I don't think I ever could have done it. Even if I'd had the looks for it, I don't think I could have done that. So I do give her credit for boldness, but then it also says something about her personality to some people, and it would be used against her somewhat. Oh, sure. You know, if, if you're a dancer in a club, you're less meaningful to people. Yes, but it certainly shouldn't be that way. No. No, of course not. So as a young single guy living in Austin and then in Houston, Jeff was a real party guy. Over their years of being wild and carefree, Jeff and his buddies would get together and they'd go for days without sleep. There was an endless supply of alcohol, drugs, and women, especially women. But when Jeff met Susan, he was nearing 30 and thinking about, you know, maybe it's time to settle down. He was making good money for a guy his age, and he wanted to have a family someday soon. So it was a sunny day in 1997 when Jeff saw 21-year-old Susan with a group of friends on the beach 
on the Gulf of Mexico. Jeff was talking with the husband of one of Susan's best friends when she caught his eye. Susan was shy and she didn't speak to Jeff that day. But later, when she went back to her car, she found Jeff's business card under her windshield wiper. So she called him up the next day and invited him out to dinner. Jeff fell for Susan right away and she really loved getting the attention of an older man. By this time, she had quit dancing, she'd taken some community college classes, she'd worked in a hair salon, and she was now working as a waitress. But Susan liked Jeff right from the beginning. He was very charming and sweet when she got him away from his group of buddies. He'd had a lot of life experiences too, and he knew all the best restaurants, and he always made sure to take her to nice places on their dates. Jeff called her every day and wanted to see her as often as possible. He told his friends that he'd met the one. Susan was the woman he wanted to marry, he said, settle down with, and have a family. So this was a whole new Jeff who his buddies had a hard time taking seriously at first. Oh, good. So it seemed like he was changing. Yeah. And then Susan was pregnant with his baby, so things changed rapidly. She'd had doubts about whether Jeff was too old for her, and Jeff still had his doubts about whether he was really ready to settle down. She's still pretty young. Yeah. So there was a lot of back and forth until finally in the fall of 1998, Jeff proposed to an eight months pregnant Susan. So he didn't uh, really act too fast there. Kind of right under the wire. He was thinking hard. Yeah. Jeff had leaned over in his car and handed her a ring, and Susan, teary-eyed, had said yes. Jeff would later tell his friends that Susan's acceptance of his proposal had likely saved his life. Two weeks later, in a small ceremony, they were married. The honeymoon had to wait because there was a lot to do to get ready for the baby. So on the night of their wedding, they celebrated at the Outback Steakhouse. Probably had a bloomin' onion. That's where they have the bloomin' onion, I think. There it is. So after their baby boy Bradley was born, they moved into a small three-bedroom house in the White Oak Bend subdivision in the Cypress-Fairbanks section of Houston. Cy Fair, as the locals call it, was known to be a good place to live. White Oak Bend was an okay neighborhood which the couple could afford. Built in the 1980s, with curvy streets and about 200 homes, it was the kind of subdivision where young couples bought their starter homes, their first homes. But Jeff liked being a husband and a father. He bragged about his wife and son while at work. He liked his new image of success and security that being family man gave him, and that image certainly helped him in business. Yeah, but according to Susan, Jeff became a different person with her after their son was born. She would say he began calling her a fat ass for gaining weight during her pregnancy, and then when she suffered from postpartum depression, he refused to let her take the antidepressant that had been prescribed by her doctor. He told her that motherhood wasn't rocket science and that she just needed to suck it up and do her job. And that's <laughs> according to Susan. So she believed that Jeff wanted her to be a stay-at-home mom. And she meant literally, like never leaving the house. She was allowed to make quick trips to the grocery store or visit her mother, but she was expected to be back home within 30 minutes. Jeff seemed very nimble at moving from family man to party boy, too, especially when it came to his business dealings. If his clients wanted Jeff to be an earnest husband and father, he could portray that. He had his suburban house and family as proof of that. But when friends or clients wanted to party and go to one of Houston's many topless bars, Jeff could easily adjust to that as well. And Susan came across very well in public also. She made Jeff look good when they got together with his family and friends. But when they were home alone, Susan could turn on Jeff. She objected to his wilder ways, but he had no intention of changing his habits. So in his opinion, he was a respectable enough guy. So if he wanted to smoke a joint once in a while to relax, that was his business. But marijuana wasn't his only vice. He really liked the euphoric high that came with his cocaine use. So that's going to be problematic. A lot more money for cocaine than marijuana. I would think so. He still enjoyed sitting in the strip clubs and watching the new talent dance in platform heels. He stuffed a lot of dollar bills near their G-strings and bought his fair share of lap dances. 
But then Jeff began spending way too much money on his partying, especially the cocaine. I could imagine. When he overextended his finances by several thousand dollars, it would irritate him to hear Susan complain about it. <laughs> he would say that being a salesman had ups and downs, and she just didn't understand that he had to ride it out. He felt like he didn't need the aggravation at home when he had enough to worry about at work. It's like lay off, I'm a hard working man type of thing. Yeah. Now, despite these early issues, Susan was pregnant again in 2000, but she miscarried, according to Susan, after Jeff kicked her in the stomach. Now, there's no medical record of this, but she would claim that Jeff hadn't allowed her to go to the hospital for any medical care. So that's questionable. But Susan was pregnant again and gave birth to their daughter, Kaylee, in December of 2001. Again, she suffered from postpartum depression and according to Susan, Jeff started seeing other women who he met through an internet dating service. So by the fall of 2002, according to Susan, Jeff had changed jobs and the money was getting very tight. His behavior was getting worse, and he bought an air rifle. Susan would later claim that there were multiple incidents of physical abuse by Jeff, but there wouldn't be anyone to back up these accusations. So she's abused, but she never sought medical care, or confided in friends. Not that we know of, no. And, you know, it's hard. You want to believe her, but when she doesn't come out with it until later, when she's in trouble herself, it makes it kind of suspicious to me. It's tougher. It is. So on Monday, January 13th, 2003, Jeff drove his blue pickup truck home. Returning to work on Mondays was always difficult for him. But as a successful salesman, Jeff knew how to go with the flow. He dealt with both retailers and wholesalers, moving carpet and tile orders all day long. But then on Mondays after work, before he returned home to his wife, his little boy, and his baby daughter, he would take out his tension and frustrations by going to a weekly boxing lesson. So that Monday, he'd also bought several lines worth of cocaine. But Jeff was a big guy, 6'3", 220 pounds, so he could hold his own in the ring. But he was also 34 years old and an amateur. There were many younger, more athletic guys at the boxing gym, so Jeff liked the edge that the cocaine gave him when he was fighting. There was actually a lot about cocaine that he liked, and at this point, it was becoming clear to him that he had been liking it just a bit too much. It wasn't free, and he didn't have a mountain of available cash. But each time he had a chance to buy some, he would do it. Yeah, I think that's called addiction, is what yeah. we're, you know, kind of dancing around here. Well, in his case, it was also deficit spending. Yes, that's for sure. So that evening, Jeff made it home in time for dinner with the family. What happened in the hours following his arrival is only known to Susan, and she's been a bit of a questionable historian. So what we're going to share about that evening is the story as put together by the prosecution when Susan goes to trial. Now, much of this is based on evidence at the scene, but some of it really can't be completely known, and we kind of have to make some educated guesses about precisely how it happened. So four-year-old Bradley was young enough to be easily impressed with his dad's adventures, and Jeff liked to tell him about his boxing matches. So when Jeff got home, he had a quick kiss and a how was your day from Susan when he came in the door. But she knew about the cocaine, so she likely gave him a disapproving glance. This didn't matter to Jeff, but that was her problem. Jeff gave his baby daughter Kaylee a kiss before he went into the other room to see if Bradley wanted to do some playful sparring. Bradley liked to play box with his dad, but that night Bradley was in some kind of a mood. Jeff was distracted and Bradley wasn't up for playing. So half-heartedly, Bradley punched his dad's open hands as Jeff playfully weaved back and forth in front of him. Jeff tapped Bradley on the face, and Bradley whined, so Jeff apologized. But Susan claimed that the cocaine was making Jeff too aggressive with the kids. So normally, she would have been on him in seconds, complaining that he was being too rough. But for some reason on this night, she didn't say anything to Jeff about it. Susan went into their bedroom for a few minutes, and then she came back. She'd been standing a few feet away from him and looking at him. Her blonde hair had been taken out of its usual ponytail, and she'd brushed it down over her shoulders. It was way too early to go to sleep, but Susan was wearing a silk bathrobe, 
hanging off of her body loosely enough so that Jeff could tell she was nude beneath. Susan had been a stripper or topless dancer back when she was 18, so she did know how to strike a seductive pose. And Jeff liked this. His wife was looking beautiful and she was smiling at him. So Jeff turned off the TV and stood up from where he'd been sitting on the couch, as Susan motioned for him to follow her into the bedroom. So Jeff followed her into their small bedroom, where the lights were off and red candles were burning on the bureaus and the end tables. Soft music was also playing gently in the background. He's thinking, okay, this is good. As the door shut behind him, Susan stepped out from the shadows and embraced Jeff, and she began kissing him passionately, unbuttoning his shirt, loosening his belt. Jeff opened the front of her robe, and he was running his hands along her skin. Then suddenly, Susan stopped at the side of their wood frame bed. Playfully, she whispered that Jeff should lay down on their bed. Jeff is really getting into this at this point. He's still high from the coke he snorted earlier, and his mind was kind of spinning. He, he's thinking that this is going to be his lucky night. Yeah, so Susan reached into a bedside drawer and removed a couple of Jeff's neckties. Leaning over to kiss him again, she took Jeff's outstretched left hand off of her breast and looped the necktie around his wrist. Giggling, she quickly tied the other end of the tie around one of the vertical wooden slats on the headboard. Jeff's hand was still caressing her body, but Susan took the other necktie and tied it around that wrist as well, and then put it up around the other corner of the headboard until both of Jeff's arms were stretched out above him. So his attention was likely focused on Susan as he watched her seductively remove her robe and let it fall onto the floor. She bent over and picked the bathrobe sash off the floor in one smooth gesture, giving Jeff a view of her candlelit body. She then tied the sash around his left ankle and secured it to a footpost of the bed. Susan was smiling at him as she finished tying another sash to his right ankle and pulled it into position on the fourth corner of the bed frame. So as Jeff watched his wife move her nude body over to the edge of their bed and put one leg up to straddle him, she sat down on his naked lap, smoothing her fingers down his chest. So if Jeff saw this as his wife accepting that he was in charge and that she was trying to rekindle their romance, he really couldn't have been more wrong. Now Jeff was naked and tied spread eagle on their bed. As he looked up into the candlelight at his nude wife, a look passed between them that gave Jeff a chill. Because far from looking at him with love and lust, Susan seemed to be studying him and making plans. She especially seemed to be studying the four posts where Jeff was tied up to the bed. Jeff was very turned on, certainly ready to have sex, but this was taking far too long. So Susan scooted back off him, reached for one of the red candles that was burning beside the bed. Jeff's becoming increasingly impatient, wanting her to hurry. But Susan had already turned back around with the candle in her right hand, and she ran her left hand across his chest, moving toward his groin. Thinking that things were finally picking up, he could feel her breath on his chest as she kissed her way down his skin, and he felt her hand brush over his crotch and down his inner thigh. But he's anticipating what would come next, and rolled slightly from side to side, and worked against the neckties that were holding him to the bed frame. Susan raised her head up, and with her left hand, she continued to stroke Jeff's thigh. But then what happened was painful and unexpected. Susan glared into Jeff's eyes, turned the candle upside down, letting the hot wax pour under the sensitive skin of his inner thigh. Ow. Ow was right. He cried out in pain as the burning wax ran down into his crotch. Jeff began to yell for her to untie him, but Susan wasn't paying attention to what he was saying. Jeff hadn't been able to move more than a couple inches in any directions. Susan had control of him, maybe for the first time in their marriage. Yeah, maybe. But any sign of affection or seduction had left Susan's face. Instead of being nude and sexy, she was naked and angry. Jeff lifted his head up for a closer look at what was going on. Susan had gotten off the bed again, and she had her back to him, and she was rummaging through one of her dresser drawers. The pain from the hot wax being poured onto his groin had diminished and everything had been going great in his mind when she just flipped into this angry mood. So Susan slid back onto the bed. She had taken something from the drawer, but in the dim light from the candles, she'd kept it out of his sight. There was something about the way Susan was acting that Jeff did not like one bit. 
Something was going on with her that he wasn't used to seeing. But as the next few seconds passed, Susan seemed like her sexy self again. But that thought was blotted out of Jeff's mind when a shocking, searing pain shot through his body. Something razor sharp had sliced into his penis. Jeff screamed and strained to sit up, but all he could do was lift his hips up and down. He was tied down tight. He looked on in horror as he felt Susan grab his bleeding penis with her left hand and hold up a seven-inch stainless steel hunting knife in her right hand. So Jeff was trying to comprehend that Susan had just deliberately cut him and that the knife she was holding must have been in her dresser the whole time. So she must have planned this attack and tied him up to keep him from fighting back. When she brought the knife back down and sliced at his penis again, Jeff had to have been terrified and in agony. So still straddling his waist, Susan raised the knife above her head. Now filled with rage, as she watched him strain against the bonds she had him in, she seemed resolute. Despite the horrible pain and his thrashing, Susan actually seemed to be emboldened by the violence that she was inflicting on him. Now Jeff had spent their marriage believing he was in control, but now Susan had taken the upper hand. Susan set the tip of the knife blade against Jeff's upper chest, so he could only move five inches to either side, and the point of the blade would move with him. Susan watched him struggle, and she brought the blade up over her head before she plunged it into her husband's chest. Then again and again, she slammed the knife up and down into Jeff. Now at one point during this stabbing, four-year-old Bradley knocked on the bedroom door. Susan would later claim that that was when she tied up Jeff and went to tend to her son. Then she returned and continued stabbing Jeff. But this would be used against her later when she would try to claim that she had snapped and just stabbed Jeff in a frenzied fog, because this made it sound very planned. So in the candlelight, Jeff was now bleeding profusely, and Susan, as if she was an autopilot, just kept stabbing. Children were sleeping down the hall. Neighbors were just yards away in each direction. But she continued to raise and lower the knife, even after Jeff was no longer responsive. Most of the hits landed in his chest, but Susan struck into every part of him she could reach. Flecks of blood covered her body there on her neck, her face, and her hair. In a frenzy of blows, the tip of the knife blade broke, and that was inside of Jeff's skull. The blade had been plunged straight down into and through Jeff's eye. Jeff had been dead for a while, when finally, exhausted, Susan plunged the knife into his body a final time and let it fall from her hand onto the blood-soaked bed sheets. And this room must have looked like a slaughterhouse. Absolutely, yes. So maybe for Susan, a huge weight had been lifted. There wouldn't be any more arguments. There'd be no bitter divorce, no custody battle to worry about. Really, no more Jeff, period. Jeff was gone. But Jeff's big, heavy, dead body was still tied to the center of their bed. And there was this overwhelming mess. So Susan must have soon realized that her work to eliminate Jeff from her life had really just begun. When she walked to the doorway and turned on the lights, the room was a stunningly gory crime scene. Everywhere she looked, she would see drops of bright red blood. It covered the bed, the bedding, the walls, the floor, the furniture. There was even some on the ceiling and there were pints of blood that had poured out of Jeff's body and into the mattress, the box spring, and the carpet. So there was a lot to deal with before the kids woke up the next morning. So Susan showered and got dressed, thinking that this had all seemed a lot simpler when it was just in the planning phase. She began to feel like she needed to talk to someone. She really wanted to talk about Jeff and how all of this was his fault. He had made her do this. Jeff might be dead, but she was still angry about what he had put her through over the past four years of marriage. Susan couldn't call her mother, she thought, because she also lived in Houston. And if her mom became worried enough, she might drive over to the house to talk to Susan in person. Then there was the same problem if she called her younger sister, Cindy. Cindy was a psychologist, and she'd helped Susan before when she and Jeff were having problems but Susan couldn't risk Cindy coming over to the house either. So that only left her in-laws in Austin to call. That's about 150 miles away. Susan picked up the phone and made a call to the Wrights. 
Ron and Kay Wright were shocked by what she told them. Susan described Jeff returning home in a rage that evening from boxing lessons and throwing a violent tantrum. During this, she said, he'd hit Bradley in the face and beat her up. When they asked to speak to Jeff, Susan said that they couldn't because he'd taken off. When they asked her how long she thought he'd be gone, Susan said that she thought he had left her and the kids for good. I don't know. Didn't she make that up on the spur of the moment? I think so. Because this isn't a great excuse. No. It's going to get the in-laws going. Well, there are a lot of holes in her plan. I'd be afraid that they'd show up at my house. She said, I just had a terrible fight with your child. And uh, he's taken off and he said he's gone for good. If I'm Jeff's parents, I'm going to go over, which she doesn't want anyway. She doesn't want that. And then that last comment she made that he was gone for good was very stunning to Jeff's parents. Yeah, they'd seen him and their daughter-in-law and their grandkids every other week since Jeff and Susan got married. They'd known about some of the ups and downs in the marriage, but they had no reason to suspect things were so bad. It had been over the holidays only two weeks before when they had all gotten together and Jeff had seemed fine. Now Susan was telling them that he'd hit her and hit Bradley and stormed off never to return. The Wrights asked Susan why he would do such a thing, and Susan's short answer was that he was on drugs. Susan said that Jeff had been taking drugs for some time, and it was now a severe addiction. Also, she added, Jeff had been missing work because of it. He'd also been getting deeply into debt, and he tried to borrow several thousand dollars from friends to catch up on his payments for his cocaine. So this is upsetting and unexpected news to the Wrights also. Jeff's father knew that his son had had a drug problem in the past, but he had been under the impression that it was all in the past. And none of this story from Susan sounded like the Jeff that they knew. And this was a shock. Of course it was. Now Susan talked to the Wrights for over an hour and really upset them. They were concerned about her and their grandchildren and they wanted to get in touch with Jeff and find out what was going on. They wanted to help the young family and help bring Jeff back to his senses. But Susan was being evasive. She claimed that she had no idea where Jeff had gone. Her best suggestion to them was to wait until the morning and then call him at his office. So finally the call ended. It had been cathartic for Susan to tell someone else what a jerk Jeff had been but she was still in the same hot water she'd been in when she first called them. She still had Jeff's body on a blood-soaked bed, and now she'd told other people that he was gone. So now they'd be looking for him. So Jeff's parents spent a sleepless night that night thinking of ways to reach Jeff and figure out what was going on with him. Susan spent the rest of the night awake in Houston, too, trying to make sure that no one would ever find out she'd butchered her husband. During their four years of marriage, Susan had worried all the time about where Jeff was and what he was doing. But now she had much more serious things to worry about. First, she had to get his body out of the bedroom and make it disappear. But Jeff weighed 220 pounds. There were a lot of places to dump a body in the 8,700 square miles of the greater Houston area. But it's not like she could just stuff him in a car and drive off in the middle of the night leaving the kids alone in the blood-stained house. The houses where they lived were packed tightly around her house on Berry Tree Drive, and lots of cars would drive past even after dark. She really couldn't risk being seen. So walking out onto the screened-in patio behind the carport, Susan looked at a shallow hole that Jeff himself had recently dug for a home improvement project. He had been planning to install a fountain with a small pump buried underneath. Jeff had cut away a three-foot-wide piece of the concrete from the patio. Then he dug a trench in the dirt underneath it. So the hole was alongside the wall of the bedroom where his body was. The hole wasn't very deep, but it did seem big enough to hold a person. So looking at the hole, Susan decided that that's where she would bury Jeff. So back in the bedroom, Susan had a good look at her husband's body. She had stabbed him a lot, hundreds of times. His face and upper torso were pretty much obliterated from the attack. The neckties and sashes were still in place, 
and they had stiffened with Jeff's dried blood. After trying for a couple of minutes, Susan gave up trying to untie them. She took the knife and cut through each one. Now she had to get Jeff from the bed out onto the patio. She pulled him off the bed. He hit the floor with a loud thud. Susan tried to get a grip on Jeff under his armpits, but the amount of blood on his upper torso made her try a different way. She grabbed him by his ankles. This was difficult, and she didn't want to make noise that would wake her children. But Susan slowly dragged Jeff's nude corpse through the dark house. She was able to move him to the concrete patio on his back, leaving a trail of blood through the house out the door, and onto the concrete. So this is like a bad movie. I can't imagine someone actually doing this. No, except for the horror of it. It's almost like a Keystone Cop scenario. It's a mess, yeah. It's a mess, and I guess she could use this to say, you know, I wasn't in my right mind. But then there's a lot also to say that it was planned. Yes. So once outside, Susan dragged and pushed Jeff's body into the ground. Finally, he was in as far as he could go. He was bent forward, kind of in a sitting pose. So Susan let his head flop face down onto his knees, and then she began to shovel the pile of dirt back over him. But he wasn't buried very far down. He was less than a foot under the ground. He might be out of sight, but the sun was going to be up soon. And besides that, the kids were going to be up soon. She needed to feed them breakfast. So we have to step back into mommy mode and act as if nothing happened. I guess. Now, the way I envision this is that he really wasn't totally under the ground, but there was a mound of dirt over him. So he was kind of sticking out. He was. So this was a very poor burial. What I picture from this is that he's, yes, he's in that trench that he had dug, but he wasn't level with it. There's some of him above ground. So even when she filled it in, it made a mound over his part. Exactly. That's the way I see it, yes. Now, that could also make you think maybe it wasn't really planned out that much if she didn't know what to do with his body. So, I don't know. Well, I think the planning was how to kill him. Right. But there hadn't been a plan for after he's killed, what do I do? Yeah, I think you're right. But the killing had to be planned if she had a knife in the bedroom and all that. Yeah. That seems planned. She's dressed seductively, knowing that he'd respond to that. Yes. And... Playing the little sex game, a little bondage, tying him up. He'll go along with that. Seems like it. That makes sense to me. Yeah, that was planned. Now Susan took a roll of paper towels and retraced her steps from the patio back to the bedroom, mopping up spots of blood. There would be time to clean up the bedroom later that day, and then she would have to figure out how she and the children were going to move forward with these new lives. So she'd done the worst of it. But now she had to figure out how to get away with it. Jeff was temporarily hidden under the patio, but daylight showed Susan the enormity of the task she would face when cleaning up that bedroom. This was so much more difficult than just a house cleaning job. It was more like a complete remodel. Looking at the bed, it was obvious that someone had been murdered on it. The blood had completely saturated into the sheets, onto the bedspread, into the mattress, and even the box spring so they were well beyond any cleaning. She really would have to get rid of them, which would be no easy task. No. It's hard to get rid of a mattress even when it's not bloody. You have to go to the dump. You have to pay for it. She couldn't do that. I guess if there's a grappler out front, but you can't just leave a bloody mattress out front on trash day. So it is a conundrum. It's a tough decision. It really is. So she stripped off the sheets and put them into a trash bag. Then she took a metal dolly and rolled the mattress out to the backyard. Next, she took out the box spring and the wood bed frame. Susan knew she had to figure out a way to get rid of that mattress and box spring. Even though she could use Jeff's pickup truck, it was a problem. Anyone who looked at it would be suspicious immediately. And if she dumped the mattress into a vacant lot, someone would eventually find it and likely call the police. Susan decided just to leave it in the backyard for then (laughs) and concentrate on the inside of the house. So that's just not a very good solution. No, so now she's got a a body in the backyard that could easily be discovered. Yes. And she's got this bloody, bloody mattress. Right. Everything's bloody. So with the bed removed from the bedroom, it was clear to her that the bedroom carpet would have to be removed or bleached as well. So there's another huge job. 
It's going to And it to probably be... got into the padding, maybe even the wood underneath. Yeah. So it's really just not feasible to cover this up, unless she was to burn the house down, possibly. After trying to scrub the blood off the walls, Susan realized it would be faster to just paint over it. Yeah, that never works. We've, we've covered cases where they try and paint over it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. She went down the hall, took a bottle of bleach from the laundry, and started in on cleaning the carpet. She used up the whole bottle on one big bloody spot. It made a minimal difference. Certainly not enough. Well, no, I have, um, in my ignorant youth, I've tried to clean up carpet with bleach. Just makes a big white stain. It doesn't work. I mean, it might kill the bodily fluids so they can't be tested, but it's going to be obvious that you've bleached it. Yes. So that's really not the answer to anything. She knew she'd need to buy more bleach, too, so she went out to buy bleach and paint. The whole time Susan was preoccupied with trying to make the crime scene disappear, she also had two children and a dog to entertain. The dog had actually become very interested in the patio area where she'd buried Jeff, so she knew if the dog could already smell Jeff's body, eventually people would start to smell it. So she decided that if she put more dirt on top of Jeff, then it would be like the same thing as burying him deeper, which is not true. There had to be a point at which the depth of the soil on top of the body would hide the scent from the dog, she thought. I think she was wrong about that as well. Dogs can really smell something like that. Susan then loaded up her kids into Jeff's pickup truck and went to run her errands. So first she drove to the office of her doctor. She had some superficial cuts on the back of her right hand and he checked them and cleaned them for her. Then she drove to the mall where she bought paint, paint rollers, jugs of bleach, and ten large bags of topsoil. Back at the house, Kevin Conboy, who was Jeff's supervisor at the carpet factory, called, wondering why Jeff hadn't shown up for work. So Susan explained to him that Jeff had come home drunk the night before. He had hit Bradley, so she had thrown him out of the house, and she said she had no idea where he had gone. Conboy was surprised, and that's putting it mildly. Susan seemed calm enough, but Conboy was getting more concerned as he tried to figure out what was going to happen. Susan said that Jeff was having financial problems, and she thought this was one reason for his behavior. Yeah, so Jeff's parents called Susan back during the day, wondering if Jeff had come back yet. Susan said that he had come back midday, angry as ever, to collect his clothing. But once again, she said they'd gotten into an argument. And Jeff was so out of control, she said, that he'd grabbed a bottle of bleach from the laundry room and shaken it out all over the bedroom and her clothing. Susan said she had no idea where he'd gone this time and that Jeff had forgotten to take his cell phone with him, too. It's getting very, very shady here. A short time later, Susan told the same story to her close friend and neighbor, Jamie Dar Hall. So Dar Hall was upset by the story. She'd suspected that Susan might be the victim of abuse, so she felt bad for Susan. She had told her before to call the police and file a report, and she'd also urged Susan to change the locks on the house in case Jeff came back in a rage. By this point, Susan had to be completely exhausted. She'd been up all night and all day. Jeff had been dead less than 24 hours, but already things were out of control. Concerned people were calling her and asking, asking increasingly difficult questions. So Susan knew she only had a few days at most to get everything back under control. The next day was a Wednesday. Susan loaded Bradley and Kaylee into her car and headed out on a nine-mile trip to a police station in the neighboring municipality of Spring. Susan walked through the door of the Harris County Constable's office wearing jeans and a sweater saying that she wanted to report a case of domestic abuse. This would be her first report of spousal abuse by Jeff, and he is already dead. Right, so I definitely see this as her attempt to make it look like she was an abused woman. Yeah, she's trying to get out ahead of things now. Right, and maybe she'd be able to say she killed him in self-defense eventually. Although she doesn't seem like she was thinking very clearly either. While at the police station, Susan requested a restraining order against Jeff. Her story was pretty straightforward, and the deputies had heard similar ones many times in cases of spousal abuse. 
Susan said she'd been willing to put up with his escalating belittlement and beatings during their four years of marriage. But now, since her husband had begun hitting her oldest child, she was no longer willing to let this continue. Now, domestic violence is the number one cause of injury to women in Harris County, as it is in most other counties across the country. So she did have sympathetic ears at the police station. Susan spoke with Deputy Constable Scott Hall of the Family Violence Unit, and he looked at the Nixon cuts on her right hand and wrist also some dark bruises on her arms and legs. But Susan seemed sincere. She was a very together-looking 26-year-old with two young children. The injuries were minor, and Bradley didn't show any signs of physical abuse. But Deputy Hall noted Susan was afraid and photographed her injuries. Kaylee was too young to interview, but an investigator from Harris County Children's Protective Services took Bradley into a playroom at the office. They began by getting him some crayons and paper, and then a video camera was turned on, and Bradley was quizzed about what had really been going on at his home. The investigator led Bradley through a series of questions about his home life, and Bradley said he couldn't think of any times when he'd seen his father hit his mother. But he said for four nights in a row he could remember his father coming home and punching him. Bradley said he hadn't done anything wrong to deserve being hit. So when I read about this, I thought he had been coached by Susan. Because what four-year-old is going to say four nights in a row? Um, Not many. And he didn't have a mark on his face. If a grown man had actually hit him, he would have some kind of a mark. So I really am kind of believing the playful thing. And I think that Susan kind of built that up in the child's mind. You know how easy it is to manipulate a four-year-old. Sure. So that's how I see that. And when it was Susan's turn to be interviewed... She gave her story about that Monday night. She began with Jeff coming home in a rage and storming out after he'd hit her and Bradley. Then she broke down and cried several times for the next three hours. The deputies filled out paperwork and they filed arrest warrants for Jeff on two counts, assault on a family member and injury to a child. So they were prepared to send a cruiser straight out to wherever Jeff was and arrest him, but they didn't know where to find him. Susan said he wasn't at home and she didn't know where he was. She claimed that she hadn't seen him since he left the house in a rage two nights earlier. But remember, that's a different story than what she had told Jeff's parents. She told his parents that he returned the next day and poured bleach in their bedroom. So she's already not keeping her story straight. So Susan's ready to go home. But for the police, this was the beginning. In a normal domestic violence case, the police expected that at a minimum... There would be counseling for both parties, a scheduled trial or plea bargain on the criminal charges, and an eventual divorce. Deputy Hall asked Susan why she hadn't already filed for divorce. Susan said something about how divorce didn't seem like a very Christian thing to do. Hall took Susan over to another office and introduced her to the victim's assistance liaison. Harris County saw Susan as a victim in need of help. Yeah, women who are abused often do want to minimize the severity of their situation. And when Susan was taken in to see the victim's assistant liaison, she was urged to fill out some paperwork that would get her the help that she needed. Susan insisted that there was no need for her to check into a battered women's shelter, but the county was preparing to help her through its Crime Victims Compensation Program. The liaison gave her the forms and helped her fill one out. The liaison explained that Susan was potentially eligible for help with everything from the cost of her medical expenses to counseling to legal fees and any other financial burdens that might come up as the result of her and the children being abused. After reporting that her husband had just beaten her and her son two days before, Susan really had no choice but to fill out the paperwork that came with this situation. Back at Jeff's office, things were becoming more and more difficult for his supervisor, Kevin Conboy. This was midweek, and Jeff's phone was ringing off the hook. Customers demanded to know what was going to happen to their carpet orders. So Conboy decided he was going to head out and look for Jeff himself. He checked many places where Jeff often went, but no one had seen him. So finally, Conboy took a drive over to Jeff's house. Jeff's pickup was in the driveway, but when Conboy rang the doorbell, no one answered. 
So frustrated, he returned to work to try and make sense of this whole situation. He was having his third really bad day in a row at the office, and Jeff hadn't even called in. When he called the Wright's house, Susan had changed the outgoing message on the answering machine, and she'd removed Jeff's voice from the recording. When Convoy did talk to Susan, it sounded like her marriage with Jeff was over, and he really saw a nasty divorce in Jeff's future. But Jeff had no future. So Convoy didn't know what to do when the Harris County Sheriff's Department called and asked how they could find Jeff. They had warrants for his arrest related to the domestic violence complaint. So he decided that Jeff was fired. As soon as Jeff did call into the company, Convoy planned to tell him not to bother coming back. Well, yeah, he's angry with him. He thinks he's just taken off. Yeah. But we have to remember, he didn't take his cell phone, and his truck was still at the house. Right. Then that Friday, Deputy Constable Hall called Susan again to tell her that the court had granted her restraining order. Hall said the police were all set to serve it on Jeff, but they still couldn't find him. Susan didn't have any new information, she said. And she did say that Jeff had left his cell phone at the house. Yeah, now by Saturday morning, Susan was about to break. The kids were young enough that they couldn't tell anything was really wrong, but they had a routine that was very disrupted anyway. Susan could keep them out of her bedroom while she cleaned, but they also had to stay off of the patio and out of the backyard all the time. By that weekend, co-workers, friends, relatives, neighbors, and the police were calling and looking for Jeff. They were also offering to come over and be with Susan, but of course that was the last thing she wanted. The bedroom was still a bloody nightmare, and she'd only managed to get half of the carpet cut out. Plus, there were paint cans and cleaning products all over the house, and not to mention that pile of blood-stained bedding in the backyard. If anyone walked through her house, they would immediately know that a murder had happened there. So Susan was getting pressure from all sides. Questions were being asked, and she couldn't think of any good answers. For her, the murder itself had been the easiest part of this whole ordeal. Cleaning up the evidence was just overwhelming. Really hadn't made much progress. Not a lot, no. It seems like she's kind of uh, just spread the mess around. And all the stuff was in the uh, backyard. A lot of stuff was in the backyard, yeah, so it was spread out. The dog was driving her crazy. Susan spent hours in her bedroom trying to cover the stains and the blood spatter. She could manage the children and ward off everyone who was calling, but her dog, a chow mix, had gotten out onto the patio and it had begun digging up something that it had smelled in the soil. The thin layer of potting soil that Susan had spread over Jeff's corpse was scattered all over the patio. Then the dog began running around with items that it had pulled from the shallow hole. A dirt-covered bathrobe sash had been dragged into the backyard. A blood-stained hunting knife was sitting just a few feet from the hole. And then there was the one really terrifying item. Jeff's corpse was partially exposed. His left shoulder was completely unearthed, and his arm was outstretched forward as if he were trying to grab onto the concrete slab and pull himself out. So this was like a scene from the Night of the Living Dead when the corpses crawl from their graves. And visible beneath the arm was the back of Jeff's head. You could see where the dog had been scratching away the dirt from Jeff's hair. Then, as a final and disturbing affront to all common decency, Jeff's left hand was out on the patio. The dog had actually chewed it off of the arm. You know, maybe in an effort to just help him crawl free, we don't know. But how horrifying. Yeah, after this horrific sight, Susan knew that she couldn't go through another day like this. No kidding. (laughs) I can't even imagine going through any time like that. She was in way over her head. She needed to get help. So Susan put the kids in her car again. She drove to see her mother, who had spent the week on the phone trying to comfort her daughter. Her mother didn't think much of her son-in-law either. She thought Jeff was violent from early on in their relationship. If her daughter's marriage had now come to a point where it really was going to end, then it actually came as somewhat of a relief to her. Many couples divorced, and it wasn't the end of the world. But Susan's mother couldn't get a straight answer from Susan about what had happened. Because it really kind of was the end of the world. It was definitely the end of the world for Jeff. Yes, it was. Now, back in Austin, the Wrights hadn't just been calling Susan in their search for Jeff. They'd also talked with Susan's mother, 
And after they had compared what Susan had been telling her mother against what she'd been telling them, things were not adding up. Everyone was noticing that Susan didn't seem to be very concerned about Jeff leaving her and the children. And the fact was that Jeff hadn't just walked out on his wife and kids. It seemed like he had disappeared from the face of the earth. There was no financial trail, and no one had heard from him. Susan's story about Jeff stomping out on Monday night and then returning Tuesday morning for his clothes, without taking his pickup truck or his cell phone, really made no sense. Speaking to her mother that Saturday, Susan had talked about restraining orders and worrying that Jeff would kill her. But it wasn't making any sense to her mother either. So finally, Susan told her mother that something awful had happened. And her mother had looked her in the eye and said, Susan, did you kill Jeff? Susan had then slumped forward with a nod and put her head down on the table, like a gesture of just giving up. So now the truth was out. And this was way beyond what Susan's mother had thought she would have to deal with. Yeah, if uh, it wasn't so sad, it would be kind of comical, like you said. She began to think of a plan to help her daughter. Susan needed legal help, and with Jeff dead, there was also the issue of who would care for the grandkids. She suggested that the kids go spend some time with Susan's sister, Cindy, who was a child psychologist. Then Susan would meet up with her lawyer as soon as possible at her house. It was a Saturday, but the family had contacts with the prestigious Houston law firm of DeGuerin, Dixon, and Hennessy. They would send someone out if it was an emergency. Susan agreed that this was the best thing to do under the circumstances. So the two women took Bradley and Kaylee to Target to buy some necessities, and the Burger King for lunch before Susan headed back home to wait for the lawyer. Yeah, so this was attorney Neil Davis, and he received a message from his law firm that he needed to go see a client's daughter in northwest Houston right away, even though it was the weekend. So the details were unclear, but it had something to do with a husband and wife having a fight and the husband going missing. The woman's mother was describing this as a life-and-death emergency. Davis arrived at the Wright's house on Berry Tree Drive that afternoon, and it looked like a normal suburban home. He was met at the door by a pretty blonde 26-year-old woman who looked like she'd been crying a lot. It was an awkward conversation, but as they sat in the front room talking, she told Davis about her husband and the four years that she'd been married to him. She said there were serious problems. She said that Jeff was controlling and that he could be violent. And as Susan talked, she sobbed and referred to Jeff in the present tense. She was most concerned, she said, about a big fight that she and Jeff had had just five days earlier. Susan said she had been home taking care of the kids when Jeff arrived from a late afternoon boxing lesson and he was high on cocaine. He'd mixed it up with Bradley, she said, in a little father-son play boxing. But when Bradley didn't want to be involved in it, Jeff had become angry and hit the four-year-old in the face. She said that when she objected and put Bradley to bed, Jeff had turned on her in a rage. Susan said that Jeff had taken her into the bedroom and raped her. And after that, she had decided that she'd had enough. She said that this had gone too far and that Jeff had to get help for his drug habit. But this, she said, had just made Jeff even angrier. Still high on cocaine, he came at her with a hunting knife. She thought she was going to die, she said. Then suddenly, she decided to fight back for the first time in her marriage to Jeff. So this is kind of a heroic story for her. It is. She jumped up off the bed and grabbed for the knife from him. And surprised, Jeff had hesitated for a split second, and that was all Susan had needed to get a grip on the knife herself. As the two of them fell down on the bed, she stabbed Jeff. Then she said she stabbed him again, and again, and again. More again for like 190 more times. Yeah, I mean, if you're splitting hairs. Davis wanted to know where Jeff had gone after being stabbed so many times. Had he gotten to a hospital? Was he dead? Susan, too, acted confused about that. She talked about reporting him missing, 
and she also talked about putting him on the patio and pouring dirt on him. She kept saying that when he woke up, he was going to be angry and it would come back to hurt her and the kids. Susan described spending a week trying to clean up the bedroom. Yeah, I don't see how anyone could do that. He's been buried in their yard for five days. That's There's some decomposition happening. Yeah, you think? That's gnarly, yeah. Susan walked Davis through her house to the patio and she opened the door. Looking out at the patio, Davis was stunned. The smell of death was obviously in the air. And at the edge of the patio, up against the side of the house, he saw what looked like an arm, with no hand, reaching up from a body that was just beneath the dirt. He had been standing in a normal-looking little house on a weekend afternoon, next to a woman who had told him she had stabbed her husband, and now she just led him to the body. Susan had already told him that her children were with their grandmother on their way to her sister's, so that was one thing he didn't have to worry about. He knew that he had a duty to call the police as soon as possible, but as a defense attorney, he also had a duty to do the right thing for Susan. If he called 911, the police would race out to the scene and take Susan into custody as a murder suspect. But it seemed to Davis Susan was in no condition to talk to the police. It was his responsibility to keep her legally protected if and when this went to trial. Yeah, I don't know if I'd be able to think that clearly, so I have to give him credit there. He's got his lawyer's hat on. I mean, wouldn't you just kind of freak out? <laughs> yeah, especially yeah. if I'm looking at a body right. partially submerged with an outstretched arm missing yeah. a hand. and I'd be kind of afraid of this woman. Yeah, I, well, I certainly wouldn't turn my back on her. No, no, no. <laughs> so Davis decided to make some calls and drive her straight to the neuropsychiatric center unit of the Texas Medical Center. He gave her instructions about keeping quiet and told her not to say anything about her case to investigators without him being with her. He would talk to the police. He would tell them about the killing, and he would be there when detectives did eventually interview her. To report Jeff's death to the authorities, Davis drove to the Harris County Justice Complex to speak to the prosecutors in the intake division. Yeah, the staff on weekend duty at the office knew immediately that something was wrong, just by looking at Davis as he entered the building. His hands shook as he turned over a business card and wrote Susan's home address on the back of it. Davis explained that he was a lawyer who had an important message on behalf of a client, and because of attorney-client privilege, Davis said, he couldn't tell them who he was representing. Handing his card to the assistant DA, Therese Boos, Davis told her, there's a dead body at this address, and I can't say anything else. Police cruisers and detectives took only minutes to show up at the right house. The officers let themselves in through the wooden gate and knocked on the front door. When no one answered, they walked around the sides. With flashlights, they could see a patch of dirt at the edge of the patio, and clearly there was a dead body sticking up from the dirt. After investigators got into the house, they quickly found the body, the bloody bedroom, the blood-stained mattress in the backyard, and a pile of bags of potting soil stacked in the back of a pickup truck. Police made the connection between the body and the fact that Jeff Wright had been reported as a missing person. So they quickly put together a working theory that the corpse was Jeff Wright and that he'd been killed on the blood-soaked bed. Those facts meant that Susan was the only logical suspect. The condition of the body, after a week in the ground meant that a positive identification of his remains would require the medical examiner to be sure. Now, there were three main areas of evidence. The patio, of course, where Susan had dropped Jeff down into a seated position. That, along with the dog's digging, had left it looking like Jeff was trying to pull himself out of the hole. In a flower pot just a few feet from his body, there was the knife that was missing the pointed tip, and it was covered in dried blood. The second area of interest was the couple's bloody bedroom. It had been five days since the stabbing, and it looked like Susan had been working ever since then to try and clean up the room. But despite her efforts, it still looked very much like a murder scene. There was still blood just about everywhere you looked. Then the third major area of interest was the small enclosed backyard, where they found the wooden bed frame that had been taken apart and stacked in pieces next to the blood-saturated mattress. So it was pretty obvious that Jeff had probably been stabbed in the bedroom 
and his body had poured blood out onto the bed. There was no sign of blood in their vehicles in the driveway and no indication that there were any other places the detectives should be looking for evidence. So it took detectives several hours to dig up Jeff's body. He was stiff with rigor mortis, and there was early decomposition. As the investigators worked painstakingly to carefully remove the dirt, they noticed that the body was naked and had suffered a huge number of stab wounds. They were all over his body, and the ones to his head had obliterated his facial features. So he got a bloody lump. It's horrible. It really is. Detectives also noticed ligatures tied around both his wrists and around his left ankle. The ligature ends were hanging and had been cut, but they were still firmly tied to Jeff. So this suggested that Jeff had been tied up at some point during or after the killing. After Jeff was zipped into the body bag, put on a gurney, and taken to the morgue, investigators put all of the loose dirt from the gravesite through a sieve. By the time they were done, they were confident that they had gotten everything out of the hole that had been put into it. Investigators also had no idea where Susan had gone. Susan had reported seeing Jeff Monday night and then again on Tuesday morning. The last time he'd been at work and talked to anyone was Monday, so they believed that Jeff had been buried for a few days. Later that weekend, detectives were able to interview Susan's mother. She told them the little bit she knew about Jeff's death that she'd learned from her conversation with Susan on Saturday morning. She said that her daughter had confessed to killing Jeff and putting him in a hole, but said it had happened because Jeff was trying to kill her. Self-defense. Yeah, that's hard to believe. I mean, it didn't look good. But the police were prepared to hear Susan's side of the story. A grand jury could possibly see the killing as self-defense, and they might decline to indict her. But the autopsy would help them to determine if this was murder or possibly self-defense. Medical examiner Dr. Wolf performed the autopsy on Jeff that Sunday. He drew a diagram of the stab wounds, bruises, and other injuries, measuring the width and depth of each one. There were so many wounds on Jeff's chest, neck, and head that many of them overlapped one another, so that made it difficult for the doctor to distinguish in the most severely damaged areas where he was looking at an individual stab wound or if it was actually several stabs. He was able to identify 193 separate stabs, but at the same time he was confident that the total was somewhere over 200. The most interesting thing about the pattern of the wounds was that, with one or two exceptions, they had all hit the front of him. And this was unusual because anyone who's being attacked with a knife will put his arms out in front of him to defend his head, throat, and torso. That's why so many stabbing victims have defensive wounds on their hands and forearms. But while Jeff had stab injuries on his arms and a few on his hands, the largest number of wounds on his body were on his chest, more specifically his upper left chest. So the doctor examined all the wounds looking for the one that had actually killed Jeff. But in the end, he decided that not one of the wounds was fatal in and of itself. Dr. Wolf concluded that it was the loss of so much blood and not the trauma, as grievous as it was, that it caused Jeff to die. So the average adult male has about a gallon and a half of blood in his body, and Jeff at 220 pounds would even have a bit more. But the circulatory system can't cope with so much blood loss before the drop in blood pressure causes shock to set in, and this sets off a chain reaction of major organ failure, which led to his death. There was no indication that Jeff had tried to staunch any of the bleeding or get away from his attacker at all. Jeff had been tied up, and he had bled to death, and his killer had continued to stab him after he died as well. When Dr. Wolf took a careful look at Jeff's back, there was a single significant stab wound midway down Jeff's right shoulder blade. In addition to the single stab wound, there were also some minor surface injuries on Jeff's back. But the interesting thing about these scrape marks was that they had occurred post-mortem. So the the scrapes backed up the detective's conclusion that the body had been dragged from the bedroom out to the patio. Right, so that's how his back had gotten these scratches, these scrapes. And one of the biggest issues was the question of how Jeff had been overtaken and killed by Susan. How could a healthy 220-pound man have been overpowered by a 120-pound woman so that she was able to stab him 200 times? There was no incapacitating hit 
seen on his head, and there were no signs that he had fought back or even moved much while being stabbed. The reason for this seemed obvious. The ligatures that were around Jeff's wrist and his left foot had been there before the attack began. Lying on his back while tied down to a wooden bed frame, even a 220-pound man would be completely vulnerable to anybody with a weapon. Well, no shit. Susan could have taken her time and killed Jeff. And that's what it seemed like she did. It sure suggests it. I mean, Jeff was naked, and he had been tied up with neckties and a bathrobe sash. So it didn't take too much to think that his wife could have convinced him to enjoy some kind of kinky bondage. And there was one other piece of evidence that Dr. Wolf found that led investigators to conclude that Jeff and Susan were involved in a bedroom game before the stabbing. And this was the trail of candle wax which had been drizzled down Jeff's inner thigh leading up toward his groin. It was becoming clear that Jeff had let his guard down in his own home in candlelight with his wife. Jeff had been seduced into his bed and then methodically killed by someone he thought he could trust. After the autopsy was done, investigators became determined to lock Susan up for the rest of her life. They were convinced that she had planned this out and murdered him in cold blood. But Jeff's parents learned about his death when they checked the Houston Chronicle's website that Monday to see if there was any news about their missing son. There was an article saying that he was dead and that Susan had admitted to killing him. All of the local newspapers and TV stations in Houston reported that Jeff had been stabbed 193 times by his wife and that her lawyer was saying she'd done it because she feared Jeff would kill her and harm his children. So it was shocking that no one had called them to notify them of their son's death. What a horrible way to learn about that. No kidding. I mean, there's no good way, but this is not okay. This is terrible to let them come upon it that way. Now, you could say the police should have informed them, but in a normal family, the wife would have informed them, you would think. Yes. But since she was the suspect, you can't expect that. Well, but her mother knew. She could have called them. Absolutely. But who would want to? Would you want to call them and tell them? I wouldn't. No, but they deserve it. They deserve to know, absolutely. But I do think it is the police's responsibility to do that. Yes. Yeah. Harris County Constable... Ron Hickman told reporters, she, that's Susan, alleged the typical family violence kinds of things, evidence of contact wounds and bruises. Defense attorney Davis sat down with reporters and explained that Susan was as much the victim as Jeff, that she had acted in self-defense because she thought her husband was going to kill her and her two children, and she was suffering from severe psychological issues and getting treatment at a psychiatric hospital. This is just really hard for me to see as self-defense. And I think I'm not the only one that sees it that way. Clearly, the prosecution saw it the same way. Commenting on reports that Susan had buried Jeff in the backyard, Davis said, she just wanted to get him out of the house. (laughs) He probably didn't say it in that tone, but, you know, it's kind of funny. Over and over, Davis repeated that Susan had been a battered woman. In one TV interview, Davis explained that Susan had not reported any of the abuse in the past because Jeff had threatened the lives of her and the children if she ever did. And there's just enough truth in that to make you say, well, maybe. But then you have to think about what she did to this man. The police had access to stacks of interviews with Susan's friends and relatives, and they were convinced that Jeff had been killed on the night of January 13th. That was that Monday. That put Susan's visit to the police to report abuse and file for a restraining order on January 15th in a very suspicious light. Susan had to have known that Jeff was dead, so this looked like a clear cover-up attempt. Was she going to go there and say he was abusive and then try and stage it like he'd come at her after that? Kind of seems like that was her half-assed plan. Yeah, I guess it's the best she could come up with. I guess. It's not real bright, though. Unless you believe that she was in some kind of psychological trauma, which I'm sure she was, but it was definitely self-induced, in my opinion. So detectives urgently wanted to speak to Susan. They knew from her attorney's statements to the press that Susan was in a psychiatric ward, presumably in the Houston area, but because of attorney-client privilege, 
Davis was under no obligation to tell them where she was. But the prosecutor's office was using every method they could think of to put pressure on Susan. With over 200 stab wounds, they didn't think they were looking at a valid self-defense case. The prosecutor, Kelly Siegler, finally issued an ultimatum. Either Susan showed up by noon that Friday to tell her side of the story, or she was going to be arrested and charged with murder. Kelly Siegler became a Harris County prosecutor in 1986. She now has the show Cold Justice, which has been on TV since 2013. She has been extremely successful and well-liked in the world of true crime, but there have been issues over the years of her career as a prosecutor. One of her issues stems from the murder of Belinda Temple and the conviction of her husband, David Temple. State District Judge Larry Gist criticized her behavior before and during the murder trial of David Temple, who was convicted of killing his pregnant wife, Belinda, in Katy, Texas in 1999. In a 19-page decision, Gist recommended that Temple get a new trial because Siegler withheld evidence that could have helped Temple, including investigations of alternative suspects. Yeah, Gist said, The defendant has shown he was denied a fair trial because of the state's failure to disclose or timely disclose favorable evidence. And had that evidence been disclosed or disclosed timely, the results of the trial would have been different. So although several courts have looked at the case and upheld this conviction, some judges have disagreed with the way the trial played out. Bill Harmon, a former state district judge who ruled on pretrial motions in the case, said in a sworn affidavit in 2013 that he would have ordered the release of reports, statements, and lie detector results connected to a police investigation of a teenage neighbor if he had known about them. Temple supporters continually have said a teenage neighbor may be the killer, a claim that has been repeatedly refuted by prosecutors and that neighbor's attorney. David Temple was convicted in August of 2019 for a second time for killing his wife Belinda, but that jury couldn't decide on a sentence, so the judge declared a mistrial. Prosecutors had sought a life prison term. The 2023 resentencing trial took two weeks and contained the same evidence presented to jurors in both of the previous trials. It took a Harris County jury just a few hours to decide on a life sentence for the former coach. We've covered this case back in October 2017. Can you believe it's been that long? I just saw that date. I said, holy cow. Yep. This was an episode of True Crime Brewery titled Sympathy for the Devil, The Murder of Belinda Temple. It's one of our most memorable episodes for me. I'll never forget that case. Me either. The Wednesday after giving the ultimatum to Susan Wright, Sigler told reporters that she had made a decision to go ahead and charge Susan. Sigler had the preliminary autopsy report and the interviews in which Susan's mother had said that her daughter had confessed that she'd killed Jeff. Sigler filed formal murder charges against Susan. Susan Wright is wanted for the murder of her husband and is not in custody, Sergeant Tommy Kaiser told the Houston Chronicle. We have no idea where she's at. Her attorney is telling us he has her checked into some psychiatric hospital somewhere. We asked if he could have brought her up to talk, and he declined. Yeah, while well, talking to the Chronicle himself, Davis responded, She's been in a terrible mental state. She's just way too fragile psychologically to talk to the detectives and undergo hours of interrogation. Since the authorities still didn't know exactly where Susan was, she had a chance to visit with her children and with her sister. She also consulted with Davis, and then Davis announced that on Friday morning, Susan would show up with him at the Harris County Courthouse and turn herself in. On Friday, January 24, 2003, Susan surrendered at the Harris County Courthouse in downtown Houston. Davis had arranged for her to turn herself in ahead of her arraignment, which was scheduled for the following Monday. Susan came into the courthouse at 9 a.m. and she was formally charged with murder, and she was held without bond until her arraignment. It seems like she was treated pretty well to me. You know, you have to wonder, is being a pretty blonde middle-class woman working in her favor here because 
it's just really strange to me that they let her turn herself in like that, and then she's going to get Bond. Yeah. Yeah. So on Monday, January 27th, Susan was in the courthouse for a bail bond hearing. The main purpose of the morning hearing was to determine whether Susan was a flight risk and a danger to the community. In making their arguments, the prosecutors showed some of the evidence that they had against Susan, affidavits that quoted investigators about specific details of the case. And in that paperwork, the press got its first hint about what Susan had been doing in the days after killing Jeff. So Davis tried to get Susan's bond set to $10,000, but Siegler argued that this would show preferential treatment for a woman whom Siegler was convinced was a cold-blooded murderer. The judge agreed with Siegler, but he set Susan's bond at $30,000. He also ordered Susan to give a saliva sample for DNA testing before she left the courtroom. So Susan was returned to the jail, but only briefly following the hearing. And that afternoon, with her parents' help, She posted bail and was allowed to leave with her relatives. The fact that a female prosecutor was assigned to the case made things more difficult for Susan's defense. Susan would have had a slight edge going into the case because she was a woman. As a woman trapped in a relationship with a controlling husband who used drugs, Susan was potentially a sympathetic figure. That argument would be easier if she were up against a male prosecutor who would have to be careful not to look like he was beating up on a battered woman. Right. I mean, just reverse this in your mind and you know it wouldn't go that way if Susan was the man in this position. Not at all. No, not a chance. So her trial began on February 23, 2004. To gain an acquittal, she would have to convince at least one juror that she could have been defending herself from an attack when she snapped after four years of abuse and stabbed her abuser. Now, legally, it really didn't matter whether Susan stabbed Jeff two times or a thousand times, as long as the first time she stabbed him was a legitimate act of self-defense. Siegler had heard Susan's story, and after reviewing it, She not only thought Susan was lying about what she had done to Jeff and the reasons why, she was confident that she could prove it to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. Siegler was so confident, in fact, that she didn't even bother to offer a plea bargain. Now at trial, Susan spent two days on the witness stand describing her marriage. After their wedding, she said, Jeff became a different person. She said that he called her fat when she was pregnant, blew off her postpartum depression, and became very controlling. She said that his physical abuse had escalated after they moved into their house in 1999. She said that he had kicked her repeatedly in her chest and stomach. She said that he began to beat her often, and she rarely left the house to keep her neighbors from knowing. Now when she was asked again why she didn't get a divorce, she said this time that Jeff had threatened to kill her, and that was why. Remember before she said it didn't sound like a very Christian thing to do, which was a strange comment, because probably the stabbing murder is not very Christian either, if you want to look at it that way. One problem was that the jurors heard almost no testimony supporting her claims. A couple of friends testified that they had noticed a half-circle bruise under one of her eyes once, but Susan explained that Bradley had accidentally hit her with a toy. The prosecution had friends and co-workers of Jeff's Testify that he was a great guy who would do anything for you. One friend described their marriage as very happy. He was described as a very proud father who had changed his life for the positive after years and years of partying. On cross-examination, Siegler asked Susan about her two months as a topless dancer, and she suggested that she had used sex to get Jeff nude and bound to the bed. She pretty much rolled her eyes when Susan claimed that she was able to grab the knife knee Jeff in the groin, and push him off of her. She thought that was ridiculous. Now what Siegler did, which was kind of controversial, is she had the Wright's bed set up in the courtroom, and she did a reenactment of the murder, along with assistant D.A. Doyle, who stood in as Paul, and Siegler acted as Susan. And this really got her points across dramatically. The defense did object to this, but they were overruled. So she was able to climb on top of this assistant DA after having another 
attorney tie him up and go over the stabbings, the locations of the stabbings. It was dramatic. Siegler really tore apart Susan's claims that she had been in a fog in the days after the killing. She claimed that Susan had known exactly what she was doing as she tried to cover up the murder. And in closing arguments, Siegler told the jury that Susan's story was an insult to their intelligence. If it really was self-defense, she said, Susan would have taken the children and left as soon as she had them tied up. So that makes sense to me. She called Susan a good actress and a good liar. But prosecutors cast doubt on Susan's characterization of Jeff that evening, noting that the only thing that anyone had to go on was Susan's word that Jeff was out of control that night. What if Jeff had just been playboxing with Bradley that night? What if Jeff had never had the knife? What if, as the autopsy clearly suggested, Jeff had been tied up and then tortured? Then everything Susan said about that evening was a lie. And then everything she did in the next five days was an attempt to cover up a murder. It took the jury only five hours to return with a verdict of guilty. She was sentenced to 25 years to life. An appellate court upheld her first-degree murder conviction, but agreed to consider whether the sentence was appropriate. After seven years... A new jury was brought in to hear testimony to decide if Susan would get a sentence that could be anywhere from probation to life in prison. This time, she had a witness on her side, Jeff's ex fiance Misty McMichael. Now, that's yeah. the first time we've heard of this woman. Right. But she was in the 48 Hours mystery about the case, and she was quite a character. She was another um, exotic dancer, and she was kind of outspoken and... She didn't really follow the judge's instructions well. She really got on the judge's nerves quite a bit. But McMichael testified that Jeff had been abusive throughout her relationship with him. She said that he had once thrown her down a flight of stairs and cut her with a broken glass. So with this new information, Susan's sentence was reduced to 20 years, which was five years less than the original sentence. And in December 2020... Susan was released on parole from the Lane Murray unit in Gatesville, Texas. That was after serving 16 years in the prison. According to the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles, Susan is on superintensive supervision until 2024. She has court-ordered anger management counseling and wears a GPS monitor. The children have been raised by Jeff's family. So well, I'm she, glad for that. She has no contact with them? No. I mean, they're adults now, so that's kind of up to them if they want to have a relationship with her. Yeah. So this is the point in our show where I ask for your feedback, your five-star reviews, and support. Please leave us your feedback and case suggestions by voicemail, by clicking on the link in our show notes, or by email to truecrimebrewery at tigrabber.com. We would also appreciate it if you could leave a positive review of the show on Apple Podcasts or on whichever app you use to listen to us. And last but not least, if you'd like to get your TCB episodes without ads one day early and get one to two bonus shows every month, plus a gift and a handwritten thank you note from us, we would really appreciate you subscribing at tiegrabber.com or on our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash tiegrabber. It's time for listener feedback. Now on the feedback, we have uh, a voicemail and I think a couple emails for you. So the voicemail is from Jennifer, and she has a case suggestion. Hello, this is Jennifer, and I'm calling from Collinsville, Illinois. I am right across the river from St. Louis, Missouri, and I have a case recommendation and a beer recommendation from my town. The case recommendation is about the Merrifield sisters. It is a story of sibling jealousy and rivalry that turn deadly. And the beer recommendation is from Old Herald Brewery. They bought an old newspaper plant and they turned it into a brewery and distillery and a restaurant. And the beer that I'm going to recommend from them is the Printer's Inc. It is one of their most popular beers. It's a young brewery and it is all newspaper themed. The names, all the beers, all the things on the menu. Hope you check them out. And if you do the case, I'm happy to ship you some beer. Thanks, Jennifer. 
That sounds like an awesome place. I'd like to visit it. Me too. So have you ever heard of that before? Is that new to you, that brewery? Oh, it's new to me. Yeah. Sounds great. Thanks, Jennifer. What about the case? Well, it's a simple tragedy. So Jossie Merrifield had just gotten home after giving birth to her second child when she vanished. On August 12th, her body was found face down in a pool of water with a head wound. And that very same day, her half-sister, Sandra Merrifield, came home with a new baby. She told her husband she had just given birth. Now, That's nuts. That's just nuts. He, he didn't believe her. Good Can for him. Imagine? I can't imagine. And urged her to go to the police, which she did do. She was charged with first-degree murder, but took a plea bargain and was found guilty of second-degree murder. So, of course, there's a lot missing there in that story. Was she pretending to be pregnant before this? Was this plotted out? There's a lot more to learn about it. There is. I gave you the bare bones. But I just, um, this killing a woman and taking her baby and claiming it is yours just never seems to work out well for anyone. No, it doesn't. No. But thanks, Jennifer. We will look into covering that, and we'd love some of the beer. So we have an email from Lisa with a case suggestion. I'll read this one, and you can read the next one. Okay. So Lisa writes, Hi, Jill and Dick. I enjoy listening to the TCB podcast as it makes my days fly by at work. Well, thank you, Lisa. She goes on to write, I have a true crime recommendation from an area where I grew up, Mooresville, Indiana, just southwest of Indianapolis. In 1979, I was at a hair salon, and over the radio was announced that a woman and three children's bodies had been discovered at a creek not a mile or two away from where I was. They were later identified as Terry Lee Chasteen and her three children, Misty Ann, Steve, and Mark. The murderer was Stephen Judy, who had driven by Terry and signaled for her to pull her car over, thinking something was wrong. Playing the Good Samaritan... He said something was wrong with her tire, and he offered her and her children a ride. He ended up driving them to the White Lick Creek in Mooresville and raped and strangled Terry and drowned all three children. So he was caught and subsequently executed. His backstory is filled with so many red flags, I have no idea how this man was not incarcerated before this horrific crime. And he may have killed many more. There's a book by a local columnist, Bet Nunn, called Burn Judy Burn, and also an additional article. And she gives us the link to that. I'm not a beer drinker, but rumor has it that Liftoff by Daredevil Brewing Company in Speedway, Indiana, is a good one. Well, thank you, Lisa. That is a fascinating case. Usually you think if a stranger is going to pick you up to rape you or something, it would just be you. But to actually pick up a woman and three children and then drown all the children, it's... I mean, that's a whole new level of evil. And this is a person not known to him. Yeah, just a strange woman and her three children. Yeah. Who just decided to do that. Yeah. So, horrific. Something's missing in that guy. Yeah, you think. Okay, have you had Liftoff by Dear Devil Brewing? I haven't had that either. Wow. You think, geez, this guy doesn't drink any beer. What's with this guy? I thought he was some kind of expert. <laughs> <laughs> in my own mind. Well, we'll look for it, though. Okay, then we have one more case suggestion. This is from Cindy, who is a loyal listener. She was talking about the murder of two bankers in Minnesota by James and Stephen Jenkins, a father and son. Yeah, this is a pretty old one. Cindy's referring to the September 29, 1983 murders of two southwestern Minnesota bankers by 46-year-old James Jenkins and his 18-year-old son Stephen on a farm mortgage to the bankers and abandoned by Jenkins. Right. So there are a couple books actually about this case. And I think a big part of it is the farming industry and um, financial things that were going on, economic things in the early 80s that actually go along with this. So I think that could be a fascinating read. And if I enjoy the books, maybe we'll do an episode on that case. Well, let's think about it. Yep. Well, actually, we have one more case suggestion I wanted to include in this episode, and that's from Kathy B., can you read that one for me? Sure. This is concerning arsenic poisoning at a rural main church. I remember hearing of this case. Well, it was new to me. Someone put arsenic in coffee after church service in New Sweden, Maine, which sickened several congregants and killed one. This was in Arusta County. So that's like up Maine, very rural, if yep. you're not familiar with Maine. Yeah. It's the biggest county in Maine and the most northern county. 
And probably the lowest population. Yeah. Yeah. It was both quaint and horrific, someone trying to kill their neighbors. Eventually it emerged that one of the ushers had done it as revenge for losing a theological battle. So like uh, an argument over religious beliefs, I'm guessing that means? Yeah. Okay. As the population in that area drained away, two small Lutheran churches were consolidated into one. Identical to outsiders, the two churches had what was for them a deeply significant doctrinal difference. In one, the priest faced the congregation when blessing the host, and the other, the priest faced the altar. Poisoner had lost that battle, and he ultimately killed himself. Wow. That's hyper-religiosity? Sure. Grim story about the dilemmas of those stretches of our country that are losing population, having to let go of their particular identity. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I totally agree it's a grim story. I don't know. I think there's a lot more going on here than some kind of uh, disagreement or dilemma yes. about which way you face. I think there's some uh, mental illness there. I would imagine it's an economically depressed area in many ways. So there's a lot of things going on there as far as mental health. But fascinating. Thank you, Kathy. We really appreciate all of the feedback that we get. We sure do. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for your feedback. Thank you for your support. We appreciate all of it. And we'll see you next time at The Quiet End. we got plenty of seats. Come on down. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye.